Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Nicole. Perfect. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the Grants.gov webinar on our workspace. Um, we're excited that you've decided to join us today. We have quite a bit of information to cover and um, are going to go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to start with uh, the agenda and what we plan to cover today. I'm going to give you a few webinar rules, um, just rules of, the, of engagement. We're going to talk a little bit about the retirement of the legacy PDF application package, the benefits of the workspace, and then we'll get into the fun part and you'll actually get to see a live demonstration of workspace. And then we'll save a little time for um, questions and feedback at the end. As far as our webinar rules, we want to make sure that first things first, I don't know if you've had the chance, but in the, the chat box we mentioned that uh, this session will be recorded, so we want to let you know that up front. Um, we also want to make sure that you have the, your mics and your phone lines muted so that we don't get any type of interference or, uh, or kickback from your lines. During the demo, if you're interested in asking any questions, please feel free to do so in the question and answers box on the right, and if you just want to have general discussion, there's a chat box that's available for you to do so there. And at the end of the webinar, if you have any additional questions or comments or something wasn't completely clear for you, feel free to give us and um, send an email back to us at community at grants.gov, and we will answer all of your questions um, during that time. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Kavitha and we're going to get started. Thank you, Nicole. Um, let's take a small poll before we proceed with the next part of the webinar. You'll be presented with a small question. Please take a few seconds to answer. Okay, looks like a few of you have used the workspace. Um, our hope is that by the end of this webinar, all of you will feel comfortable in using workspace to apply to future grants. Most of you are familiar with our legacy PDF application package. This has been our primary application method for over 10 years now. This application method will be phased out on December 31st, 2017. Further details related to this retirement are available on the notices section of our website. If you've already built a system-to-system -system implementation with Grants.gov, you can continue to use that as a submission method. Over the years, there were several problems from the applicant community related to legacy PDF application package. Unable to reuse the forms, inability to concurrently work on multiple forms, and validation being at the tail end of the submission process are just a few of the many problems we've heard. All these problems are resolved in our newest application method, Workspace. Workspace is an online environment where you can collaboratively complete and submit grant applications. Reusing existing form data ability to work with your teammates within and external to your organization are some of the many benefits Workspace has to offer. Upfront validation allows you to correct application errors prior to submission, which minimized a rejection rate on our submissions. We'll talk in depth about all these uh, benefits as we go through our live demonstration today. As part of the demo, we'll create a workspace, add participants to this workspace, complete the application forms, and submit. At this point, I'll switch over to our training environment where I will log in as an applicant and we will create a workspace. I'm logging in as an applicant right now and once I'm logged in, I'll proceed to search grants page where we can then search for a funding opportunity. 
most of you are very familiar with our search grants page where, where um, you can search for the current funding opportunities available on grants.gov. Clicking on the package tab, you can see a list of the opportunity packages available to apply for this funding opportunity. Next to every package, you'll see two actions. The preview action will allow you to take a look at the various forms the agency requested you to submit in order to apply to this application package. Clicking on a form name will open up a PDF view of the form allowing you to understand the information requested in these forms. You can also download the instructions provided by the agency using the download instructions button here. Throughout the demo today, you will see several question mark icons similar to this one, which will take you to online help related to the page we are in. Once you decide this is the application package that you'd like to apply to, you can proceed by clicking on the apply action. You will be presented with a screen where you can subscribe to future changes for this package. After you finish the subscription, you can then identify, you will be presented with two options to apply. Option one is to apply using workspace, while option two allows you to download the legacy application package. This is the option that we talked about earlier, which will be retiring on December 31st, 2017. Again, if you have a system-to-system -system implementation, you can continue to submit using that method. Coming back to option one, we need to provide the application filing name and click on the Create Workspace button in order to create a workspace. Doing so will take you to the workspace page where you can see the list of forms provided by the agency that can be filled and submitted. At the top of the workspace, you, will be, you can see the progress bar where, which will help you to understand where you stand in the overall application process. Now that we finished creating the workspace, the created option is checked. As we proceed further, the rest of the options will be updated. Right underneath the progress bar, you can see several important details. Some of them include organization details as SAM expiration date and your dance number, while others include package opening and closing dates. By creating the workspace, Steve here became the owner of the workspace. His name is available to all workspace participants to work with. At this time, we have several ways to proceed. A basic way to continue with the workspace is for the logged in user to then download all the forms, email it to the teammates, and get them filled. Once the forms are filled, they can upload them into the workspace, check for any errors, and then submit. Again, this is a basic way, and it will not take full advantage of all the benefits workspace has to offer. In this approach, if they require to fill in any sub-award forms, uh, a sub-form can be added first in order to download the subform and email to users. Alternatively, they can a better way to take a full advantage of workspace would be to add participants. This brings us to the second topic in our demo where we are going to add some participants. The participants tab up here allows you to add people from within your organization as well as external to your organization. The Add from Workspace Organization button allows you to take a look at the list of users 
that are currently associated with your organization in grants.gov. Notice that Amy here is an AOR while Danny does not have any roles at all. All of these users can be added to the workspace and they can equally contribute in, a, in regards to filling in the form data. However, the authority to submit still stays with our AOR. Once the participants are added, they start showing up in the, under the workspace participants grid. Access can be adjusted to these participants by using manage access action. Danny here does not need budget information, hence his access can be adjusted to non-budget. Any form with the word budget in the form name is considered as a budget form in grants.gov. Now that we've added some people from within our organization, let's add John from a different organization to help us with our sub-award that we created earlier. In order to add John to our workspace, we need to first identify John's username, grants.gov username, by contacting him. Once we search for John using his grants.gov username, you can you will be prompted with his name and email address which can be used to confirm the individual. You can then provide the subform access to John and add him to the workspace. Doing so, workspace will notify all these participants that they have been granted access to specified workspace ID. When they log in to grants.gov the next time, they can access the workspace and start filling in the forms. This brings us to our third topic, filling in the forms. In order to fill the forms, we have to switch back to the forms tab. As we've talked about earlier, the different forms requested by the agency are available on this tab. You can fill the forms in the workspace in one of many ways. You can use the PDF option and by downloading the workspace form under the actions column and uploading it back. Alternatively, forms can be filled in an online form fashion using the web form action. You can also reuse the form data from any existing workspaces using the reuse action. Now that we have many participants in the workspace, the lock action here plays a key role. It will help prevent any accidental data overrides using the lock. Um, Steve here would like to lock the SF424 so none of the workspace participants can access data, can uh, update the information in the 424 going forward. Once Steve clicks on the lock action, the, all the participants in the workspace can notice that the form is locked to see Steve. Only authorized users like EBIS, POC, AWR, and the workspace owner can override the lock. Um, now that we've um, locked the form, let's try to reuse the SF424 from an existing workspace. You would do so by clicking on the reuse action. Workspace prompts you with a message that if we reuse, the data will be overwritten. Since it's a blank form, let's continue to reuse and we'll be directed to a reuse workspace form page. In here, we can search for the existing workspaces where that specific form has been used earlier. Here are a few of workspaces and you can take a look at the data in the workspace by clicking on the preview action. Once you identify a close match, you can click on the select link up here to bring the data from that workspace into the current workspace. At this time, um, the data can be updated in either one of those workspaces without affecting the other. 
Now that we have the basic SF-424 data, we can start editing the information in that to suit this workspace. Clicking on the web form link will take me to an online form version of the same form. Even though our PDF forms look very similar to the legacy PDF forms, the web forms are heavily enhanced. The left navigation allows you to get to different sections with ease. Let's change the title by clicking on section 11 and changing the value over there. The red asterisk next to each field determine the required field. Any invalid data displays error messages when user exits the field. Also, the web forms are 508 compliant with field level instructions across all fields. The current auto calculations and forward populations from the legacy PDF are forwarded to online forms as well. The check for errors button here allows you to take a look at the list of errors in this form. Clicking on the error message will take you back to the specific field where you can then fix the problem. Now that we've finished updating our form, we can check for errors. Once there are no errors, we can save the form. At this time, we can close this form and come back to the workspace. As we do that, workspace prompts you with a message to unlock the form if you are done editing it. Since, as I mentioned earlier, Steve would like to be the only person who wants to update the 424, hence he can say no, which leaves the lock still assigned to Steve even though the form is filled in. Now let's fill in the second form, a budget form, using the web form option directly. Clicking on the web form link will automatically lock the form to the current user. You can then go about filling in the form and here is an example of how an error would look on a tabular form. Notice the red screen, the red checkbox around here showing the error message and when you check for errors, the message displays detailed error. The problem can then be fixed and saved. Once the form is saved, you can check for errors to confirm that there are no further errors in the form. You can then close the form and unlock it. Let's try a third form using the download option. Clicking on the download action will prompt a message that would recommend you to lock the form if you are planning to update it. Since I am planning to update this form, I will go ahead and lock it and download the PDF. When we open the PDF, you will see that it is very similar to the, to the current legacy PDF forms. Our actual form is tied to a cover sheet which will display the opportunity and package details followed by applicant and workspace details as well. Coming down to the actual form, you can notice that the project director information from the 424 has been forward populated. The required, error message, the required fields are denoted with the yellow and the red font very similar to the legacy PDF. Now let's add a bio sketch to this person and you can continue to add other key personnel as you see fit in the next section. Now that we finished updating the form, we can check for errors and once it's complete, we can then save the form. After the form is saved, we can go back to the workspace and upload the form using the upload action available here.
simply choose the form using the choose option on the form upload window and upload the form. Circle validations are performed as the form is being uploaded. Some of them include the attachment file naming convention and virus checks. At this time you can unlock the form and proceed to the next form. Now that the subaward form, let's try to reuse the subaward form. As we've seen this earlier, there is an alert to um, that the form data can be overwritten and once we search for forms, we are provided with a list of forms. We can take a look at the preview. Um, this is again another advantage over the legacy PDF. When you preview a subaward form, you can not only see the subaward budget itself, but it also includes the subform data as well. Once you identify the accurate form that you'd like to copy, click on the select action and the data is populated into the current workspace. This brings in the data into the subaward budget as well as the subforms which can be accessed using the manage subforms link. When you get to the subforms model, you can take a look at the different subforms that got forwarded from the previous workspace. Clicking on the web form link will allow you to get to the web version of this form and you can see the list of budget periods with sections detail on the left navigation. Clicking on each one of these sections will take you to the related section. The cumulative budget calculates the totals across all budget periods and once we are satisfied we can check for errors, save the form and close it. Now that we've filled in all the forms, um, we can do a few things at this time. We can check the application for errors to confirm that there are no errors throughout the workspace. When we are comfortable with that, we can take a preview application forms which would include the data from all the forms listed together in the workspace. This can then be used for review and approval purposes. Um, now, some of the workspaces have two optional tabs available. These two tabs provide insight into agency validation and image generation services. Let's try the preview grantor validation tab. Currently, these two tabs are available for workspaces created under NIH and AHRQ opportunities. So the preview grantor validation provides you a way to request for the grantor validation. When you request for the grantor validation, workspace collects all the data that is available in various forms, sends it to the agency system and request the agency to run the validation on that form data. Once the validation was performed, the agency will send the list of errors and warnings back to the workspace. You can see the list of the detailed errors using the view action available there. You can sort the error messages by form, fix all these errors, and proceed further. The grantor image also works the same way. You can request a grantor image and workspace sends the data to the agency which will then generate an image very similar to the one that they would send the reviewers. Once the image is generated, it is transferred back to workspace available for you to download and take a look at. Notice that um, this image will also include the attachments as specified by the agency. Um, now that we've done the grantor validation and the grantor image, it's time to submit our workspace. This is the final topic on our demo. 
You can submit the workspace by clicking on the Sign and Submit button. You will have to provide a password before you submit the application. Once you submit, you will receive a confirmation page very similar to the current confirmation page with the legacy PDF. This will provide important information including your tracking number and the date time of receipt. This can be downloaded and saved for tracking purposes. Now that we've submitted our workspace, you can see that the progress bar is updated as well as our actions to upload, reuse and the web form actions are disabled. This is when workspace comes into a read-only mode and can then be reopened by an authorized user in order to get updates and get ready for further submissions from this workspace. The submissions made from the workspace can be accessed using the details tab available here. This will display the submissions made and will provide details related to the form and the attachment information for this submission. You can also download the action, the, you can also use the download action to download the complete zip file requested by the agency. Um, also, the package details including the contact information of the grantor who is hosting this application package can be found on this tab. All the actions performed in the workspace are captured in the activity tab with the performed by username as well as the timestamp when it occurred. Also, there are several great resources throughout the workspace in, as part of the question marks. Other resources can be accessed using the applicant resources section on our website. The Workspace Overview page will provide um, interactive graphics that can be used and that can be used to understand the workspace process much better. You can also see some step-by-step -step instructions as well as training videos available on this page. The Workspace Process page gets into uh, detailed instructions as to how you can create a workspace um, and do several things with it. You, you can also see the online help and training links available from each of these steps. Going back to the workspace overview page, the second graphic here is the workspace roles and this provides information related to the different types of applicants and the participation levels within the workspace. It also introduces you to the super users like the AOR with MPIN and E with COC. Going further, you will see a summary of different actions that can be performed on a workspace and who can perform these actions. Form level access as well as training videos are also available on this page. Our applicant training page under the applicant resources section also provides various videos that you can use to take in-depth training on workspace. Our notices section under the outreach will provide you information related to further notices. At this time, we'll switch back to the presentation where we can go over questions and provide answers. Um, here are some pointers on asking questions. Please type your questions into the Q&A window. You can also use Adobe Connect's raise hand feature and we'll call upon you. Um, if by any reason we couldn't get to your question by the end of this webinar, please email questions to community at grimes.gov. Hi everybody, this is Charlie and I'll be uh, moderating the question and answer portion of today's webinar. Um, the first question that we just received from Angela, we will be following the webinar today. We will send out an email to all participants with a number of resources 
so that any of the information you saw today, if you have questions that you think of later, you'll have a number of training resources that we send out later today. I do want to encourage everybody to ask any questions. If there are clarifications that you need, we know from that poll that over 80% of you haven't applied with Workspace, and our, our hope is that we can answer any of your questions so that you're comfortable logging in and uh, applying using Workspace. So based on our, our previous two sessions of the webinar, one question that we got um, in both of the webinars was, what happens if a form is not locked and two people try to use the web form at the same time or try to work on the same PDF form version? Okay, so that's what the lock is for. So if you if you're going to work on, whenever you bring up the web form, it immediately locks the form so no one else can be editing on it. When you download with the intention of locking, we prompt you and, and suggest that you lock the form at that time. As long as the form is locked, you are the only person that's able to edit the form. Now the lock can be overridden by the, someone with superpowers such as AR with NPEN. Um, but, but in general, if you have the lock, you're the only person editing the form. Okay. And also the actions like upload, reuse, and web form are disabled for other users when the form is locked to you. Right. Okay. Um, could you clarify on the reuse functionality? We had someone ask if legacy forms would be available for reuse. Uh, not at this time. So the, on reuse, you need to use another workspace form that you have access to. But at least if you fill it out once on workspace, it's available after that for your, for your reuse. Okay. Another question is about the document types. Can you upload Word documents um, as forms? Yeah. As forms? As forms. You mean it to a, as attachments? Yeah. It says, can you also upload a Word document instead of a PDF? You can attach any document to the forms, but we strongly recommend you follow the agency instructions as you are attaching any attachments. Some agencies might have specific instructions to only add a PDF attachments as opposed to a Word document, but Brands.gov will take anything you attach. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, with the legacy PDF, um, users will sign and submit through that, that saved file. Um, with Workspace, is that possible or is it done through the Grants.gov interface? It's done through the Workspace. There's actually a sign and submit button on the Workspace and that's what you use to submit the, the application to the agency. Okay. You cannot submit individual forms that you download. The only sign and submit is on Workspace. Yes. Okay. Um, so clarifying question. So each person that we add in a workspace uh, must have grants.gov, uh, a grants.gov registration. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, the next question is, can you add multiple email recipients to the FOA updates? I believe this is a reference to the View Grants Opportunity page. Yes, you can do any number of uh, email recipients. You'll probably have to do one at a time, but you can do that. Okay. Um, once you submit an application using uh, Grants.gov Workspace, what role um, can reopen or make that workspace editable again? So okay. You need to the owner of the workspace can reopen it as well as the AOR that was submitting. An AOR can do it. And your EBS POC. Yes. Okay. And more roles information that's all outlined on that workspace roles page that uh, Kavitha pointed to, which breaks down functionality associated with each role. Yeah, you want to look at the role graphic. Yeah. If someone is assigned to a form to fill out, uh, will the AOR be notified that it's been filled out? Uh, the, if, if the AOR is not in the workspace and it's the owner or in the participants, when all the forms are filled out, then the owner has the button will say complete and notify AOR, so the owner then clicks that button to notify the AOR that the workspace is complete and ready for submission. Okay. Um, 
Someone has a question. It, could you just revisit the grantor image tab and explain uh, how that works or what that was? Sure. Um, the grantor image tab currently only available for NIH and AHRQ workspaces can allow you to request for an image and this used to be a feature um, where you actually submit your legacy PDF and then the submission goes through grants.gov, agency system would then pick it up and then run through an image service on their side and you would have been able to see that image at that time. What Workspace does here is um, you can actually get hold of that image prior to submitting. So this allows you to take a look at the image with your current data in the Forms tab and you can request this any number of times and um, as you fix the errors you can request for an, another image and you can then take a look at the updates in there and take advantage of that before you make your final submission to grants.gov. But currently that feature is only available for NIH and AHRQ. We are trying to work with other agencies to add it to the other agency workspaces as well. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how does an agency ensure that only one person submits a grant application online? Is there a way that through grants.gov categories or is it an internal policy on behalf of the organization? Well, the only one that has, only people that are able to submit are the AOR, so they're the only ones authorized to submit. And as, as soon as a workspace gets submitted, it becomes in read-only mode, and then it's unable to be submitted after that unless someone reopens the workspace. Okay. If adding multiple subawards uh, to use, I believe, workspace, will all subawardees see the subforms, or can you limit participants to view only their subform information? You can lim you can limit the subform participation. Um, so now that we have two subforms available on this um, workspace, when you try to add a participant you can or manage access to an existing participant you can see the list of subforms available in the workspace and when you add the access to one and not the other they can only reach out to that one subform and you can see the list of people that are currently using the subforms by taking a look at this view subform participants the user that we added um, just now is part of the first one and the second subform does not include him. Okay. When working or when you are working on a corrected application, can you copy the whole application at once? Um, you'll be able to copy the entire application as part of our November release that's coming. But but if you're working on corrected one, you can do that in the same workspace as you said. So you submit it the first time, and then if, if there's any reason you need to change it, you just have to reopen that same workspace and make your correction and then resubmit it. So you don't actually have to make a copy. You can simply click on the web form in the 4 to 4 and adjust, adjust the type of submission to a corrected application, and then fill, make any corrections you need to make and make the submission. Yeah, and, the, and the details tab will show you all of the submissions you have made for the workspace. <coughs> okay. Um, when you referred to um, filling out a password after clicking the sign and submit button, um, they were asking, is that the AOR's password or could you explain who can push that button? Only an AOR can see that sign and submit button and when they click on it, they have to provide their own password and then can submit. It's the same person that's logged in. Okay. Um, the next question is about um, will participants automatically receive training information? Um, to clarify, the, the question mark icons that Kavitha had been pointing out are accessible to all users and all screens throughout uh, Workspace, and our training resources are publicly available. 
Um, so they are accessible to anyone. Um, the next question is, can anyone open a workspace, or is the AOR required to do so? If you're talking about creating a workspace, then you need to have the manage workspace role in order to create a workspace. So you don't have to be the AOR, but you do need the manage workspace role, and then you can create it. And then after, as far as opening it after it's created, it's any of the participants can see the workspace once they've been at it. Okay. Um, are the system-generated emails that are sent to participants as the forms completed and when the application is submitted? Uh, so I guess this question is just about when are there system-generated emails that are being sent to users? Well, the users get an email if they're added to a workspace, and then when the uh, whoever is working on the workspace, the owner, it says it's it's completed, then he, and, and he pushes the complete and notify button, then the AOR gets the a notification. And then once the workspace is submitted, then the AOR gets the information related to the submission. At this point, that's okay. all the notifications. So if a, a person filling out a form, if they upload that document and then find an error, can you delete the document and upload a corrected document? Well, you just, you, you just download or upload again the corrected document. You don't actually delete it. You just upload over top of it. So the upload process isn't complete when you have errors. Um, okay. You fix the problem and then upload it back. Right. Okay. But you can upload it when it's partially done and, yes. and it'll just still say it's in progress. So you have total flexibility. You don't have to wait till you're done to upload it. Okay. Um, a clarifying question. So each user in Workspace must be have a registered account with Grants.gov? That is correct. Okay. They do not be, need to be affiliated with the organization that owns the Workspace, but they need to have an account in Grants.gov. Okay. Kavitha, could you show how they, and I believe you covered this, but could you show how they would add someone from outside of their organization? Sure. Space? You do that from the participants tab using the add by username feature. Okay. You specify the username of the person that you would like to add and search for the person. You can confirm the person details and then specify the form access you'd like to give and save. Okay. If you if you are submitting a changed or corrected application, will you be prompted to enter the, the previous Grants.gov tracking number? The forms capture that information. For example, um, the 424, which is very similar to the legacy PDF 424, will, um, when I change it to corrected application, uh, there is another field where you can fill in the Grants.gov tracking number, and that's required when you change the form from, um, you know, the application to a corrected application. If you do not have that value, you'll be prompted with an error message requesting to fill in that information. Okay. The next question is, uh, since an owner or PI, uh, when they reopen a proposal after submitting, would that be considered a withdrawal? No, there's no action that goes on with the agency when you do that. I mean, you'd have to reopen it and then change it and then submit it back to the agency for them to even know that you reopened it. Okay. Do all existing Grants.gov users need to update their profiles to include the Manage Workspace role? So could you explain how how roles are assigned? Yeah, no. The one, people that are just wanting to participate or just need to participate by filling out forms do not need that role. Only the people that are actually going to create workspaces. Right. Or planning to be an owner of a workspace. Right. So the roles and access levels with the different actions that you can perform in the workspace will give you detailed idea of who can do what. Like, okay, based on this, an AOR or a user with managed workspace role can create a workspace. So all the list of users and the access is provided here. This is a great resource. 
Okay. So if I were a grant that I had a grant that got an account, but I didn't have any roles, um, who would I need to contact, or what should I do if I thought I needed a workspace role? A AOR with the MPIN within your organization or your EBIS POC can do that. Okay. So they would assign the role to the user. Yes. Okay. Can you? Uh, view the entire proposal as one file once submitted for agencies other than um, NIH and AHRQ? You can currently see that using the preview application forms. However, the attachment data is not included in this. We are planning to add that in the coming up releases um, where you can see um, attachment data as well. But currently, it includes all the form data, including the sub-form information. And if, and if the agency themselves provides it, then it will be available, but not in the workspace. Okay. Uh, well, that's all of the questions that we had prepared, as well as that have come through um, in chat and Q&A. Um, so with that, we'll uh, end our Q&A session. Okay. Uh, we can switch back to the presentation. Um, so here is some information on how you can contact us. Um, if you have any general questions, feedback, or concerns about workspace, please contact us at community at grants.gov email address. If you have questions as you are completing a workspace application to apply to a federal grant, please contact our support center at this information here. You can connect with us using all these social media options and our online user guide has lots of important information as well as the training tutorials. Um, you can subscribe to our blog, follow us on Twitter, and you can always email us at community at crimes.gov if you have any questions related to workspace. Do you want to share that um, on Monday we have a blog post coming out that will it provides a video of the previous uh, webinar session, which was similar to this, and it will also have a number of the key questions, some of which we discussed today, but others that were covered in the, the other webinar. So be on the lookout for that next week.